Hey guys, this is Moogan Lord here, and just as I promised, I promised you guys that I was going to do a pretty much a Xenoblade Chronicles 3 spoiler discussion video where I just give my overall thoughts about the story itself. Um, many of you guys have been asking me for it, especially in my DMs on Twitter and also on Discord, so I figured that uh, I might as well just get this out of the way. I think I gave a couple of days in my review for those who are interested in hearing my thoughts on it, so if you haven't checked out my review for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, go check it out. Now, we're going to dive right into the video. This is more of a discussion slash rant. Um, a lot of you guys were wondering, where do I put the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 story um, if I was to rank them between the three games? Now, as far as the story is concerned, um, for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, um, I feel as though that Xenoblade Chronicles 2, in my opinion, is the much better story than Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Now, the reason why I don't mention anything much about Xenoblade Chronicles 1 is because I haven't played Xenoblade Chronicles 1, even though I know the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, because you gotta love YouTube. If you want to know a story about something summarized or watch a whole full playthrough, just go to YouTube. But I did order my copy of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 def a Definitive Edition, which I'll pretty much do um, a playthrough of that sometime later on in the near future because i just did over 120 hours in xenoblade chronicles uh three and i'm not well i'm not ready to do another 100 and something hours um going back into another game i'm not ready for that i'm exhausted at this point and maybe do a video later where i do an analysis on all three video all three games and give my opinions overall now for starters you guys already know on this youtube channel how much i love jrpgs and how much i love xenoblade chronicles in general xenoblade chronicles 2 was my inspiration and everything that invigorated me to get back into the rpg genre altogether because i stepped away from rpgs because of my lifestyle i'm just been busy i'm a content creator full-time single dad i have a business i'm running on my own i'm an entrepreneur so i just don't have time to sit down and play hours of rpgs like i used to in the past growing up so that's why i stick to fighting games because fighting games is just quick pick up and play put down and just get back to my life and that changed with xenoblade chronicles 2 so i think xenoblade chronicles 2 for that but if you want more details you can definitely check out that video too that's pretty much the, the video that got me the subscribers that i have of right now and a lot of you guys have been tuning in wanting to hear my opinions on rpgs in general so when it came to xenoblade chronicles 3 um i would say this i've of course is was super excited and still still super excited uh, let's just, just make that clear um and when the first trailer had came uh, with nintendo direct i was like super like oh man like about time let's do this we've been hearing so many rumors from monolith saw about monolith solve going to reveal the next xenoblade game and it finally came to be and i think the thing that really got me super hype and excited for it was the fact is that this new world of, I of ionios had pretty much had uh showing us that something is going on here with the story and what's what's going on with the story is the fact is that we see some similarities with this new world of ionios where it borrows attributes of xenoblade chronicles 1 and xenoblade chronicles 2 and then when you look at the cast members all six of them they all has similar attributes that represent both of those games so now i'm intrigued i'm like okay what's going on here now the dlc to xenoblade chronicles 1 feature connected had left a lot of people with more questions rather than answers more specifically my brother keel lancer was like okay what was the purpose of this dlc like i'm i'm interested but what was what was, what is this what was it supposed to do what, what's next from here so that really sparked my interest even more and my brother keel lancers also sparked um, interest was sparked even more is because maybe this would answer some things from future connected maybe future connected is something that has something to do with why the worlds are being fused together and the same thing with xenoblade chronicles 2 we don't know what happened once the you know the titans come down onto the surface and a new world is being created we don't know the future of what rex are going to experience moving forward into this new world so does that have anything to do with the world of ionios as well so these are the things that really got me really really hyped for the story because maybe we'll start maybe we'll see shulk maybe we'll see the impacts that rex and them had on both of their worlds and maybe that is the catalyst to why the worlds are fused together so that was the expectations that i was going to when it comes to this game and i think you know that is to be fair when you're a fan of you know of these games you, you you tend to speculate have these expectations for certain things now 
the thing was with xenoblade chronicles 3 in the story i think the issue and the main issue is one my expectation as a fan and two a lot of the story elements and the story bits was really like highly telegraphed telegraphed to the point where most of the things and the events that were occurring within the story was quite predictable i was able to predict most of the events that was going on in the game before the events had occurred and i'll give you some examples in a few minutes but the first thing that was telegraphed was when on twitter uh monolith of japan started tweeting out characters relationship trees of the main cast and and sub characters and one of the characters was mobius now the mobius characters was something that everybody was more so curious about because they have these weird armors on they all had these unique helmets and the thing that stood out the most is that these characters don't have full names they actually go by letters you had j you have x you have m you have n you have all these different uh, uh letters now us as the community were already speculating already that these letters must represent the first letter of characters names and what really brought that out even more is once they reveal mobius named n now this had really sparked a lot of discussion sparked a lot of debate was for the fact is that n look exactly like the main character noah so before the game even came out we already was already piecing together the story that n as the mobius and Noah, the main character, something is going on between these two characters. Like, there has to be something that we have the main character, then we have this character, you know? So, fans like myself was already theorizing. So, once the game came out, we get our hands into the game. I started noticing everything that I was speculating about the game was almost quite spot on, just needs a little bit of adjustment to it. Now, I think with Xenoblade Chronicles 3, in my opinion, when it comes to the story premise, I think the premise of the story and how the story plays itself out pretty much, you know, telegraphs itself way early in the game. And I think the thing that really sealed it for me was when you get to one of the colonies uh, where uh, Uni has stumbled upon her husk. She found her husk. Now, if you don't know what the husk is, if you don't care about spoilers and you just want to just hear me rant about this, a husk is pretty much the, the fallen corpse of one of the opposing sides that's partaking in this endless uh cycle of war now the thing is in the game the gameplay mechanics you have mio and noah as offseers where they play their flute and they pretty much send off the spirits of the fallen now when you get into this colony uni finds an actual husk of herself within the dog tag so that already and this is still early in the game i think this is a i believe this is about what chapter two chapter three i believe can't remember but it was still pretty early in the game and already everything has been set up you know telegraphed so early so now we finally found out that oh snap so uni that's uni right there she had died at one point and the uni standing before you is pretty much a recycled version of herself which means that characters in this world or the cast as far as we know can't really die so now as far as death is concerned death is not really a concerning matter in this world of ionios for the simple fact that people can actually die and come back in this game so that pretty much took that realm of urgency or consequence in this game and it comes to death so that was mark one for me then mark two was the fact is that we finally got a chance to see the identity of one of the Mobius. And that Mobius was Jay. We come to find out Jay is actually Jorgen or Jargon, however you pronounce his name, which is the best friend who died a long time ago, the best friend of Noah, Uni, and Lance. He sacrificed himself, he died, and you see that in the flashback, they had discussions about it, you know, to the rest of the other cast members. So you come to find out that he's a Mobius. So this is another important set piece as far as the story is concerned that now it lets me know as the player that anybody in the game who has a loved one that's tied to the main cast could potentially be a mobius so we can expect any one of them so now his name is jay jay is short for is the first letter which we predicted earlier as fans before the game come out that jay is jorian 
So now I'm going through as a player trying to figure out the other names and the other letters of the Mobius to see if it hints toward, towards any other character that we may have interacted with in the past or anything of that sort. So that kind of just took the wind out of me when it came to that in terms of story, which means that characters aren't do not die in this game. So we press forward and we run across another moment. And I think when it comes to this part is where they set up these epic moments. And I will tell you this. I love the, cinema, the cinema, cinematography. I love the cutscenes in this game. I love I love the characterization to a lot of these characters. I really do really enjoy that man like i really love what they've done i love the setup i love the cutscenes, and I, I love the dialogue exchange between the characters so i'm not saying that this game as far as story is a bad story it's just that i had expectations that pretty much just fell apart as i started going through the game so it's this one part where you meet uh where you come in contact with the silver coat ethel and her rival kamaravi and there's a whole backstory about those two. I won't go through it because this video will be too long if I try to cover everything. So these two finally come together. Now, you helped Elfthil earlier in the game. She actually, in fact, one of the heralds that joins your party to give you her class, um, the fencer class. But she doesn't. She leaves your party because she has to tend to Colony 4 and her men. So these two finally come together, and they're under control of, of Mobius. You end up fighting the two, and by the way, I was overpowered, so these two couldn't even do nothing to us. We beat them, then the cutscene comes on, and it shows that these two defies the control that the Mobius has over them, and they end up fighting each other. Now, these two characters are rivals, and what I love about these two characters and why they're so well written in my and and what I believe, I love the fact is that these two have a warrior code or a respect for each other, even though they're on opposing ends. They have respect for each other. Silver Coat Ethel can beat Kamaravi and spare his life. He even beat her in the past and spared her life. So these two characters, in a way, have a, in a sense, it's like a romantic rivalry. Like there is like a warrior romance romance that they have for each other. And I, 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 to me, in my opinion, that was really well written. But the thing is, when these two defy the Mobius and its control, they fight each other. You already get this indication that these two are going to die. And I really started feeling this. And you can see Noah and the rest of the cast really upset and telling them, no, don't do this, don't do this, because they know what's going to happen to these two. And then they give us this very dramatic uh, uh, closeout with the two characters. They both die in a stalemate. And I really felt that. But then all that was simply erased after I realized the premise of the story that anybody can come back. So it kind of took that away. And then I'm saying to the cast members, why are you so upset? These, the, both of these characters can pretty much come back. Hey, look at what we have here. Guess what? Got Miyabi, Kamaravi, Mamba, and also the other fallen Agnes fighter. They're back, just like I said before. And you know what's also funny? Fulfill the requirements for Ethel's rank, get it to rank 10, no matter which character you pick. And you also get rank 10 with Kalamari uh, cast to rank 10. All you got to do is head back to the colony at the snow region. And you just take the new Ethel, which you found inside the cradle. You put her into the growth cradle. And guess what? She's back. The original Ethel's back. Now you have both of them in your party now. Yay, there we go. As I said before, no one dies here. There's no consequences here. Even though I love these two characters, you know, like there's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of of anything if these two characters can just simply come back. Anybody can come back in this game. So at the same time, it's dope that I have them both. But I think it will left more of an imprint on me that say, oh, man, like these were epic characters and they done their part. They done their job. And they are vehicles to move the characters and progress the main cast and move them forward. And yet, I got them back again. And also, their past memories started coming through. Um, when Kyle Marvey pretty much said Silvercoat, he remembered that name. He can't remember where you remember it from, but it shows that an imprint of their past selves are still there. It just needs certain things and events and scenarios to transpire and to, in order to trigger those, um, those memories. So... You know, that's that with that one right there.
so and then there was another story segment where we essentially finally uh, understand what's been going on uh, we finally get a chance to meet the first queen which is queen melia we finally get into the kingdom uh, we go into our throne room and then we find these capsules we want to find out the capsules of all it's called it's like an incubator that has all the um the warriors in there which is where the warriors are born and that's where no one discover hey this is where we come from now the thing is they didn't know that they are being recycled and they wound up finding out that they are recycled people they die they come back so everybody in, the, in your cast dies and come back they all had past life some shape or form one or another and then you later on find out the queen isn't the real queen and i thought that was a shocking thing and it kind of like made my heart drop is because like wait a minute so is milia and nia not really in this game they just fake so this was like a bait and switch like showing that they're in the game but that's not actually really them so i was like oh man but we go into that later well noah finally meets and come in contact with n he's a gold mobius which is like a higher rank mobius which they have never seen before and when Noah comes in contact with uh, N, his head starts hurting, which indicates that there's some connection between the two of them. And we already pretty much some, like came to that conclusion before the game came out. Eventually, the these uh, the military, the special military come in. They take all the cradles, and then you head over the sword mark, and then you wind up finding uh, run into uh, the people of the city. You want to run into Monica, which is the daughter of Vandal, Vandom. Vandom's the guy who turns y'all to the Ouroboros and everything like that. Now, what I do like is the fact is that it allowed the characters to flesh the characters out more. It's because the city kind of remind me of, and you see that this game took a lot of inspiration from this 1970s movie called Logan's Run. You really need to go check that out. I won't go through a whole thing about Logan's Run in this video. And it like it borrows some elements from the Matrix because essentially the city is pretty much like Zion, where it's pretty much the last human civilization, the last hope for everything and stuff. So that's what pretty much that is. And no one them are introduced to a cast of six other characters and you come to find out that these six were actually chosen to be the Ouroboros. Now, the Ouroboros is essentially like this power that that's, can be granted amongst these individuals. And this power is used in order to be able to fight the Mobius. Now, this power was created within, by the queens themselves, both the queens. And it's manifested through the humans and uh, the, through individuals, six individuals. And then these are the only ways you can better fight the Mobius. And that's a big threat to the Mobius is, is the Ouroboros itself. So pretty much when Vandom, out of desperation, and he's seen some hope in the main characters, he made them the Ouroboros instead. So these six candidates can no longer be the Ouroboros because only six Ouroboros can happen at a time. You can't have more than six. All right, so he press forward. What I like about what happens in the city is how Monica explains where Noah and them come from and how it works. So now they pretty much understand that these, they're, humans that has been manufactured and grown on an assembly line that's constantly being recycled for this endless war and while they're there they come to find out how the whole human experience and process work they find out where babies come from they, they find out where emotions come from where affection between between a man and a woman comes from the process of life all together they've seen children for the first time they've seen babies for the first time they've seen young people to old people they never saw what an old person looks like because they can't live past their 10 year expiration date which is all i love that part they really really drawn that out really really well i think that's the most emotional aspects of the story that i really really enjoyed the most i love that part and when you get to that part you definitely need to check that out i really felt that they did a good job with that so now that that's set up we will move forward so just to fast forward just to give you the gist so when everything is all said and done, the main thing I wanted to find out is who this Zed guy is, Z. Now, he's a Mobius. He's the leader of all of them. Now, we've seen Xenoblade Chronicles 1, where Xenoblade Chronicles 1 had their own particular villain that they had taken out. And then Xenoblade Chronicles 2 had their villain, which is Malos, took him out. So we figured that, all right, both the worlds have been saved. Who is this guy? We never heard this guy, and this guy pops up out of nowhere, and he's the new antagonist. Who is he? And that's what kept me intrigued in the story because I wanted to know where did this guy come from? How did Ionios become what it is? So we eventually find the queen. We find the queen, Queen Nia, 
And Queen Nia, after we rescue her, we pretty much essentially find out the truth about the two worlds. Now, I'm like, okay, now we're going to get some explanations. Okay, let's find out what does Shulk, what does Rex and all of them have to do with how this world is came to be, Iamios. So come to find out, there is really nothing to it. It was really a simple explanation. Now, if you guys don't know, the world of Xenoblade, the Earth that you live, that we that the characters live in is actually Earth, but it's an alternate Earth. Now, the original Earth has been pretty much split into two because of the scientist named Klaus. Klaus, who somewhat looked like Shulk. Now, he pretty much came in contact with the conduit, which is something that was found in, in Africa. It's like this this thing that opens up other dimensions and connections to other realms and realities and stuff and he wanted to recreate the universe which caused a whole catastrophic event to happen and it ended up splitting the earth into two split the earth into two and that's how you get seen blade chronicles one and two stories going on this that and the third okay so essentially what happens is nothing really nothing really like special happened it was the fact is that the worlds used to be one and then since both worlds became separate of each other the two worlds once realized and felt how it was to be one world and the two worlds just just pretty much were like entities the two worlds miss each other they yearn for each other they yearn to be one so on its own which had nothing to do with any other characters from any other from any other two games it's just that the world missed being one again so the world was pretty much trying to synchronize itself now because as they got close, as the two worlds became close to synchronizing to itself, this communication of light, which transcends both planets, allowed both queens to communicate with one another across the, both the worlds. Now, the thing I want to know is how the hell Nia become, became queen? Like, because there's no indications of her becoming the queen or anything in part two, you know? So I figured that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 will at least explain that. But... As I realized that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was made was pretty much a game that was meant for newcomers to come into the game without prior knowledge of the first two games. So that's you could take that for what it is, which means that they're not going to really make any true callbacks to any of the previous two games. So if you're a fan of the original two games, you pretty much have to stitch together meaning you know, from the previous two games and tie it into the third game. Since the third game is pretty much essentially, even though it has elements of both games, it's pretty much its own game, you know? So it didn't explain how she became a queen. When did she become a queen? When did this ever, tra how did it transpire? No, you're supposed to just go along with it or whatever like that. So, so the, yeah, essentially the two worlds pretty much yearn for each other. They miss each other. And what happens is these, the, the two worlds, was going to come together but the problem is once these two worlds fuse together that will pretty much wipe out everybody from existence and it's going to reset the world and the original world the original citizens and people of those worlds will no longer exist it just start anew with new people and everything so what the queens wanted to do was they was going to create a device called origin origin is like a big computer database mainframe to where she queen neo would create a piece of origin on one end and queen melia would create a piece of origin on the other end and then when the worlds finally collide together origin would connect together and it would create this big mother computer or database where it would take the living people of both worlds put them into the to origin and then when the world finally resets its, resets itself origin will reboot and pretty much bring everybody back with their consciousness memories and everything essentially so no one is erased no one is ever forgotten but as the world starts to come together this motherfucker named zed comes out of nowhere and he said oh hell no this ain't happening he comes in he stops and frees time he stops the two worlds from coming together now by doing that he created his own type of reality where he has complete or and i would say complete control but he has control over origin which he creates his own reality known as ionios so the world that you're standing in is not even a real world at all it's somewhat like limbo because it's frozen in between both of the worlds both the worlds have yet to fuse together ionios is in the way of that and everybody has been sucked or i would say everybody because some people has been sucked into ionios which are the two queens and then you have the main cast and the rest of the people. 
so now you're actually in a virtual i would say like a virtual simulation or limbo or something like that now ionios pretty much took the properties of both xenoblade one and two worlds to be able to create it so this is of his own creation he actually controls life and death in this world so i was like okay all right i i i'll accept that but okay where did this motherfucker come from he just come they say he comes out of nowhere so how did he come came to be where was he the whole time during the events of xenoblade chronicles one and two where is this guy like where did he come from so we later on get an explanation when you get to the end of the game you have to save the other queen because melia is actually captured and sleep and she's held captive in the center of the planet underneath the water where you can't get to it's like a bermuda triangle it's dangerous no ships able to get there but she holds the key to origin and essentially noah's uh key uh, a sword is a imitation or somewhat of origin itself that's what makes the sword so special but speaking of noah which i like i said i'm all over the place this is all from this is all from my head so there's no particular type of order what makes noah is special because we have to address N itself. We find out that there's no, it's not only that we have N, we also have M. M is also Mio as well. So how is it that we have N and M and we both have, we have Noah and we have Mio as well. We have two of the same people coexisting at the same time where the other cast members don't have second counterparts to themselves that's coexisting. How can only they coexist? Well, I will explain that before I actually wrap this up. One point, Noah finally finds out that n is him and mio found that m is her so you find out within the game when you come in contact and fight him you find out that noah pretty much is reliving this cycle he's reliving this cycle over and over again you find out that neo and noah and mio are pretty much essentially fated lovers they are pretty much lovers they were the original or boros that's trying to stop mobius and zed and what happened was in every reincarnation every incarnation of noah and mio are fated to be together and those two ends up dying each and every time over and over again noah keep losing mio over and over again and in this case in the current time noah loses mio again because n captures the party and mio only has one month left to her lifespan after they capture her n tells him that we're going to have a little sideshow we're going to we're going to do this i'm going to keep y'all captive so a whole month so you can witness mio's homecoming now when you go to a homecoming when the queen sends you off there's no coming back when the queen sends you off you cannot reincarnate or anything so he was going to make noah watch him watch the queen do a homecoming on mio and i hate it i hate it and, and it was like that's good writing when you have two of the same characters taking up the same space but they're totally different in personalities uh, he was well written written so essentially n is pretty much i would say the real noah in a way and i'll explain that in a second is the fact is that n kept repeating time over and over again and keep failing and keep losing mio now the thing was He's madly in love with Mio, and Mio, Mio's in love with him. So what happened was he got tired of losing her. Zed finally comes to, to, to this version of Noah, which is the real Noah, the prime, I would say prime Noah, come to prime Noah and tell prime Noah that, hey, if you want, if you can have her back, I can just simply give her back to you and you can have her forever. You can have the endless now, right now but in order for you to have her you have to do me a favor and the favor was he had to destroy the original city the original zion i would say like the matrix destroy them because the problem is the ouroboros is a threat to z he's a threat to, is a threat to z because he's the only they the only the ouroboros is the only ones that can stop him and noah each and every incarnation he's getting closer and closer to stopping zed so in order to stop noah from getting to take out zed he convinced him to join him instead by pretty much dangling his woman mio in front of him so the coward that noah was or the simp that he was he pretty much traded mankind to have his woman he traded her he traded mankind in. he 
he pretty much perpetuated the cycle that they're in just so he can have Mio. So the thing that I do like is the fact is that the creator of Xenoblade is also the creator of Xenogears and I love the fact is that he always sprinkle in elements of Xenogears and Xenoblade because essentially Noah and Mio is pretty much Faye and Ellie from Xenogears because this whole cycle of them keep being reborn and coming back is essentially is what happens in the story of Xenogears. Faye and Ellie are constantly reincarnated is because Faye as a kid had came in contact with the Zoar and he pretty much was yearning for a mother. So the Zoar created a mother for him, which was Ellie or Elleheim. But it did something to Faye's DNA where it reincarnates him. So each and every time he's reincarnated, Ellie comes back not as his mother, but comes back as his lover. And the cycle writes and repeats. But there's one version of Faye, which is named Lacan. He doesn't die off. After losing his love, which is Elleheim, Ellie, he pretty much goes off on his journey, come in contact with the Zoar once more, and it gives him this power where he trekked the world for hundreds of years. So in the game of Xenogears, you have Faye and you have another, you have the original or one of the versions of Faye still walking around, Lakine, which he's also the, the villain named Grav. And that's essentially what this is. N is one of the is pretty much the original Noah who pretty much gave himself up for eternity to become Mobius so he's still able to walk around and and the Noah that you're playing in the game and the Mio that you're playing in the game is essentially the I guess you could say the physical embodiment of N and M's repentance and hope they still want hope for the future and they pretty much willed uh, like unconsciously willed another version of them so that's why there's two Noah's and two Mio's so we can just fast forward uh, past all that to get to the end of all this so we finally get to the point where we save the queen and we finally get an answer to who Zed really is and this is where I was kind of like disappointed so Zed is essentially not a real person he's not a real being the, in, the, real, the antagonist of the game is not real He's pretty much a concept. He's not a person. He's a concept. And what do I mean by that? He's a concept of fear itself. Fear of the people of both worlds. The fear of what's going to happen if both worlds was to fuse together. That's what he's the embodiment of. Pretty much Noah and the entire world of Xenoblade 1 and 2. The people of those worlds pretty much created him out of their fear. He's, the, he's pretty much the figment of their imagination. So pretty much this endless cycle is due to the fear of both worlds not knowing what the future entails if they were to come together. That's what Zed is. So give you an example. Say for instance you're sitting in your room, in, in an empty room and then across you see another room with somebody sitting in it or whatever. Now these two rooms are going to collide with one another and you're pretty much afraid and you don't know what the outcome is going to be if these two rooms collide with one another so be because of your fear and the fear of the person in the other room seeing these two rooms about to collide to one another your fear creates a door as a divide that sits in between both rooms that divide and that door is a metaphor for Ionios both of your fear created that door that stops the connection or bridges or keeps everything in place and that door itself is a world to itself that was created by the fear of both of you he's just the amalgamation and fear of the people that created him and created this world of Ionios that takes attributes from both of the world's fears and put it together to create this world frozen in place so that both of the worlds won't fuse that's all that's all the final boss is that's all the main antagonist is and essentially you beat the game you find out that you you're pretty much fighting your fears. You beat your fear, and knowing them had to make a choice. And the choice was that let's move forward. We don't know what the future may bring, but let's do this. And what happens is the worlds, instead of fusing together, the worlds separate themselves once again, but will eventually fuse at some point in time, which we will never know when it will ever fuse. Which left me with more questions than answers. 
and the thing is Mio, Mia and Noah they split apart and they would say they say the party members say they will see each other sometime and they don't know when and at the end of the game it, time resets itself back to the very beginning when Noah was a kid when he saw the world fuse together or when he thought the world was going to fuse together when Ionis was first created so pretty much everything that you've done up until this point has all been erased everything has been erased and time everything starts over it starts back to when he was a kid but this time the worlds aren't, aren't fused together he just they just live a normal life without any of this stuff and the whole point of the war within Ionios this endless cycle was it was fueled to feed Zads in order to keep the world in the current state that is in that's all the overall story essentially is so I just walked away kind of like eh, kind of disappointed me um, we did see the Monado Melius showed it off on her wall um, the biggest surprise is that Nia uh, shows a picture of Rex and the party members from Xenoblade 2 in a picture saying that I'm going to come home and finally see y'all again and we see Poppy now my question was if Poppy made it to this world how come Rex and them didn't that which didn't make sense to me and the surprising thing was Rex is an adult and he knocked up both Nia, Pyra, and Mithra. All three of them have his baby. Which that caught me off off guard. But we only see the characters in pictures. That's it. So I was kind of like disappointed. Um, because like I said, how can I put this? It seems like Xenoblade Chronicles 3 feels more of a Tales game. Um, as far as the story is concerned. It feels more like a Tales game than a Zeno game. That's I think that's what it is. I think this would be perfect for as a Tales story or a Tales game, an upcoming Tales game or something, compared to what a Xeno game naturally is, you know, when it comes to its story. And I think that's what it is that really, really uh, got me feeling the way that I feel when it comes to the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. In a sense, it was more so my expectations, um, what I wanted from it, and didn't quite get that. I, I wanted to see more connections to the first and second game and because i thought this is going to be a close out of the trilogy so it's to bring everything full circle and that never happened um we didn't even get any answers to the trinity processor from xenoblade chronicles one and two because if you don't know the trinity processor is is pretty much pyra malos and the third i think it was Al alvis i can't remember his name no, no mention of the conduit, no mention of Klaus, no mention of any of these type of different elements that brought everything together. So I'm thinking that maybe they may be saving that for the next game or something like that. We do have a DLC coming that's supposed to, supposed to be a big story expansion. And I, I pray to God that it's not a prequel. I don't want that shit at all. I don't want a prequel. I don't care about I Ideos once you find out that it's really not a real world. It's just a figment of the fear created by the people that created this world and created Zed. So the world really has no consequences. So I don't want to see a prequel of how uh, uh, Noah becomes N. I think that's stupid. I think it was well explained in the story itself. We don't need that. I think we need an epilogue or uh, uh, a story that sets up the fourth game or to show us if how Neo, uh, Noah and Neo, Mio is going to get together and how all the friends are going to get together and how they can bring the world together in the right way. That's all I'm hoping for, and hopefully get some more questions answered rather than having more questions, rather than you know having things not answered at all. But overall, I, I prefer the second story over the third story. The third story is just not bad; it's just not what I expected. My expectations, I guess, was a little too high, but kind of was like disappointed um, in it um, in certain aspects. But it seemed like there was really no consequences in this game at all. It's just a matter of we need to just stop this cycle. If they don't stop the cycle, they repeat it again until somebody just, you know, say, hey, enough is enough. Let's just stop the cycle. So there's really no consequences to it. And every time I, we got to emotional parts, it just it immediately just get taken away when we realize that, hey, this person is going to be a Mobius, especially the girl Shania as well. And that whole story. So that's pretty much my overall thoughts. Um, uh, my overall rant, I would say, like I I was just walked away from it like uh, I'm kind of disappointed like I enjoyed every I enjoyed playing the game my overall experience was enjoying 
I enjoy uh, part, everything about the game, and there was moments in the story that really got me, you know, emotional and really liking where it was going. And then, but it was immediately cut short once you realize the premise of the story. And then once you get to the end, and you find out it's everything is not really real. I'm like, oh, okay. That, that kind of just took the wind out of me when it comes to that. But you know, it happens. So hopefully, Xenoblade Chronicles Four. Um, Pretty much, hopefully they'll elaborate or or something. I don't know. Like we would have to wait and see. So I'm looking forward to the DLC. They don't come out to next holiday, 2023. So we got a whole year before we get a chance to actually experience that game and everything. So uh, we're gonna have to wait. Um, so I definitely want to hear your thoughts. If you have played through it, let me know in the in the comment section below what you think about Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and the story. Um, did it meet your expectations? Where do you rank it? among the three games and it seemed like to me this is not closing out a trilogy the, I call it we call it the Klaus trilogy the, the Klaus arc like Klaus story still isn't done yet so we just want to wait and see how everything is going to play out I think when the worlds do come together for the fourth game I think that's going to be like the more like a reboot of the series to create new stories new protagonists and everything like that so we have to wait and see let me know in the comment section below what you think if you like the video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and also hit that bell to be notified for more JRPG news and discussions, rants, you name it. This is Mugen Lord signing off. I'll see you game fiends later. Peace out.